Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, I should thank the, the organizers because they, they gave me this special honor and, and, and big responsibility to present the program to, to the other program and the, the other scientists. The talk uh, will have basically two parts. I'll start in flat space, which is probably more uh, comfortable for most of you. And then I'll, I'll go to a better setup for a theoretical understanding. Okay. I tried to put here a definition of the words in the title, but I realized the definition is still needs some further redefinition. So I think it will become clear as we go along. Okay. Okay. So let's start uh, with point number one. What, uh, which basically is related to these words, what do we mean by UV completion of general relativity? So, so in general relativity, we have a parameter which is Newton constant, and that's basically sets the interaction strength, the gravitational interaction strength. But this is a dimension full quantity, right? So to make something dimensionless, so that you have a measure of uh, how strong the interaction is, you have to multiply by an energy square. So I, I will be working in uh, units like that, so that you won't see speeds of lights and h bars. So, so this is a dimensionless quantity. You can also write it in a more convenient way in terms of the Planck mass or the Planck energy. So, so this is a very large number, right? 10 to 19 giga electron volts. So if you do any experiment that drills vol energies, even at the LHC, we are at what, 10 to the four giga electron volts. So we are still, gravity is still a very, very weak interaction in scattering experiments, okay? So in that sense, uh, we know that gravity works well at low energies because this parameter is very small. But as I will now explain uh, in a very simple example, this cannot be the whole story and by UV completion just means some standard quantum mechanical theory that obeys all the axioms that you learn in quantum mechanics that at low energies reduces to what general relativity gives you, okay? But it's now valid to all arbitrary energies. So what do we mean? The word UV completion means that, completion at high energies. Okay, so, um, so let's, uh, let's think about a simple experiment. So we like scattering experiments. So think of some particle that only has gravitational interactions. Okay, I guess you like these particles, like dark matter particles or something. Mm -hmm. They only have gravitational interactions. So you send one against the other. They will scatter here in the middle. And then the particles will come out. Or you can also get some radiation, some gravitational radiation from this if it's very high energy. So let's do the experiment in a very simple way. We put here some big detector far away. But the only point of this detector, okay, it doesn't matter exactly the shape. Let's say this, uh, okay, maybe here it's better. Let's say this is some finite, um, so the solid angle that this captures is of order one, okay? It doesn't matter exactly. Some, some finite piece of the angle is captured in the detector. And then you can ask a question, very simple question, how much energy you captured in this detector from the collision? Okay. So let's take the energy detected divided by the energy you send in, okay? Total energy. So you just send in uh, the energy from the particles, right? So Okay, of course, this is a random variable, right? This is quantum mechanics, so you take some average. So the average, what's the expectation value of the energy you detect in this, in this uh, thing? And, uh, well, as I told you, so this is dimensionless, so this is going to be some function of this dimensionless parameter, right? And now, what do we know about this function? Well, as I said, we know the low energy behavior. So we know the Taylor expansion at small argument. And how do we know that? Well, we, we do what particle physics like to do. We do Feynman diagrams. So we say, let's take this particle. Okay, now let me draw a picture like that. Time goes up. So the 
the particles are incoming, and then they can ex inter interact by exchanging a graviton. Okay, so this is a graviton. And we know how to compute this diagram, and okay, there's some few other diagrams you have to compute. Let me just draw these ones for uh, aesthetical reasons, let's say. Okay, and then there's more complicated diagrams, which I will not even draw. But from these three diagrams, each diagram goes like uh, G Newton. So you have to take the square because this is an uh, expectation value. So you can compute here that this starts as E over M Planck to the fourth power with some number which is computable. Okay? So you know this number. Okay? It will depend on how big the detector is, eh? but this is all known. Okay, but clearly this cannot be the full answer, right? Because this quantity has to be less than one, right? So the first term that you get from the, if you want the classical computation from general relativity is good at low energies, but you cannot trust it forever. So if the energy becomes bigger than the Planck energy, it gives you something crazy. It gives you more energy out than what you put in. Okay? It's just inconsistent. So that's one example. And so clearly, there are many more terms here. This is just the first term in the expansion of this function. And if you want, if you have a theory of quantum gravity, you should be able to predict the full function. Okay? Let me call this function the function of quantum gravity. And the first term is what Einstein taught us. And there is infinitely many more terms to fix if you want. Okay? So if you want, that's a specific case where this word UV completion becomes precise mathematically. Please ask questions because I, I don't know if it's too simple or too complicated. I'm struggle to, so please ask if it's too simple. If you don't understand or tell me go faster if it's too trivial. Yes. Good. That's a good question. So, so uh, to do this computation, we think of uh, the gravitons just as small fluctuations on top of Minkowski space-time. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. But then you said UV completion. Right, so the UV completion probably, uh, so you're saying the UV completion is not going to be explained in this language just by putting more terms. Yes, yeah, I completely agree with you. Yes, yes, I completely agree with you. Yeah. But when you're saying UV completion, you're implying that it is still QOP? No, I'm implying that it's quantum mechanics. I, at here I'm assuming I'm not changing quantum mechanics but not like local properties of space-time. No, this I'm not, uh, I'm not imposing. Okay, so let me be a bit more precise about uh, uh, these corrections, okay? Maybe a comment is that far away, Yes, yeah, so I guess what Leonardo is saying is that if you put this detector very, very far away and, uh, and you send the particles from far away, then maybe here the geometry is complicated, you form a black hole, whatever, it's very complicated. But then very far away, you'll still be very close to flat space, so you can still think of the outgoing particles as fluctuations on top of flat space. Okay, so let me remind you. Um, let me remind you of some equations you learn in general relativity. So the action that you learn in general relativity is the matter part plus the action that um, Einstein taught us. So I will write that. I mean, if you remember it, great. If you don't, it's not too important. Okay. So this was the action that you learned where this is the determinant of the metric, g mu nu. Remember that the metric measures distances. 
g mu nu, x mu nu, dx nu is the distances. And this is a measure of the curvature. So it's the Ricci scalar. So it's a measure, it's one over the curvature, the radius of curvature squared. Okay? And if you recall, you, if you set the variation to zero, you get Einstein's equation. Okay? Einstein equation. Okay, so that's, that's general relativity. And, uh, well, this is the cosmological constant. Cosmological. Okay. This, for cosmic wave, is probably something familiar. Okay, so, um, so one thing we learned in the past decades, I think it was one of the main achievements of the past decades, is that we learned how to parameterize our ignorance. Okay? And we call that effective field theory. So let me explain how that works. So it's effective field theory, I just write it. We say, as I try to explain here, this cannot be the full story. So can we fix this uh, action that gives the entire dynamics of the space-time geometry such that we improve on this, that we at least can compute some other terms that start to improve this answer, okay? And, uh, and that's very easy to do because in general relativity, the, the principle is just that you're describing a theory of geometry. So the only principle is that this action should be independent of the choice of coordinates. But apart from that, in principle, you can write anything. These first terms that Einstein wrote are just the simplest thing you can write that is invariant under coordinates, right? So this first term is just the volume of space-time times some constant. And this is the integral of a curvature, which is something which is uh, coordinate invariant. Okay? So in principle, you can add terms, for example, like the curvature square. That doesn't break any main principle. Of course, you have to fix the dimensions. So you can use the characteristic scale, the Planck scale, to fix the dimensions. So this was uh, 1 over radius square, so energy is you can put here, but then there is an order one constant, sorry, a dimensionless constant, let me call it C1, which you don't know, okay? And this is what I mean by parameterizing your ignorance. C1 is a measure of what you don't know, okay? And now you can go ahead and take this action with one more term and recompute here, okay? So, so there will be some other vertices here that will be depending on C1, and with this action, you will fix here a new term. Oops. The next term, E over M Planck to the six. Okay, again, with some calculable coefficient in terms of this parameter that we don't know. Okay. And of course, now you can go on. So this looks a bit stupid because, okay, we don't know the coefficient still. But the advantage, and that's really extremely powerful, is that now you can do many, many different experiments, okay? And all of them will have a leading prediction from GR and the subleading prediction fixed by this coefficient C1. So many, many different experiments will all be parameterized in terms of the same number. Okay? So that's a very powerful, you still have to measure this C1, but you learn a lot about uh, the world. Okay, and of course this doesn't stop. I mean, I don't know, let me just write uh, one more if you want, okay. R to R uh, cube, or you can also take derivatives. Oh, okay, let me stop. It's not, it's really an infinite series that you can do. So, so we, we know how to compute, I mean, parameterizing our ignorance like that, putting more and more coefficients, yes. we know how to compute in principle up to arbitrary order.
Ah, okay. Okay, sorry, sorry, you're talking about normalization. Okay, I was not... Yes, I was not uh, going to those details. Yeah, okay, so in practice, there is, uh, there is some technique for doing that, so if you do, uh, if you do these computations, there will be like loop diagrams of the first term that contribute, so you will have to renormalize. So you have to choose some scheme for what you mean by C1, C2, but I mean, we know how to do this, okay? So this is more of a technicality. It doesn't change the final argument that I was saying. Any other question? Okay, so, okay, that's progress. We now have, know how to parameterize our ignorance, but what about these numbers? Okay, these numbers are called Wilson coefficients. Can they take any value in a consistent theory? Okay. So here we are starting from low energy and trying to see what can happen as you increase the energy. But suppose you have a full theory of quantum gravity that exists at all energies. Then these numbers, you have the full function, let's say. You can just tailor expand and measure them and see what they are. So can they be any number? Okay. Or are they constrained by some basic principle? And that's where the other part of the title enters. Okay. So maybe I'll go here. Yeah, that's a good question. So if you, if you take this action seriously classically and you try to evolve classical equations of motion, you will have troubles because you have like, looks like you have higher order evolution equations. So you should never think like that. You should always think that these are second order plus some perturbation. Okay? So, so you're not creating new solutions because you're treating the new terms as a perturbation and you're not really, well, it's like the self-force for the electron, right? So if you treat it really as a term, you'll have like self-acceleration modes. But if you take a solution and then just correct it by the self-force, it's perfectly consistent. So you have to do the same thing here. Actually, that's another example of an effective field theory. Okay, um, yes. Okay, so then, again, I said it was biased, so I will tell you about my art for the last few years, just for the next few minutes. So one type of bootstrap that we can use is what's called the S-matrix bootstrap. And, uh, and in the S-matrix bootstrap, you follow this general rule. So the only thing you have to choose is what is the observable. So the observable we choose here is precisely a scattering amplitude. Or scattering amplitudes in general. And uh, so and then we have to choose what are the basic principles that you're going to use to constrain those scattering amplitudes. And, uh, and in this case, the basic principles well, let me write back in, huh? that we use are, uh, well, if you want, relativistic invariance, so Lorentz invariance, um, causality, so the, the response, well, the output, coming particles cannot come before you send in the, the particles. And uh, unitarity, okay? So in quantum mechanics, time evolution is just a unitary operation in the Hilbert space. So this basically has to do with conservation of pro probability. Okay? Well, in this problem, it's basically the, the bound that this, that this must be less than one, right? Less than one. Okay, so um, so I will not explain you the details here because I don't have time. I want to pass to problem number two. But this is a very explicit example of this philosophy where you compute or you, you parameterize your scattering amplitudes in terms of these Wilson coefficients. And then you impose these properties at all energies assuming you have the full scattering amplitude, and you see what bounds you get for these numbers. Okay. So should I tell you this? 
yeah, so let me, let me tell you. So for this, so many of us are working in this direction, similar variations of that. Let me tell you about one specific example we did. Okay, so I think for precisely this problem as I formulated here, we still don't know how to do it for technical reasons, but there is some variations of that that we know how to do and we'll get there at some point. So, uh, yeah, I just want to mention this one because this is useful to connect with the idea of UV completion because in, in the case we studied, we had string theory, which was, which we believe is a full UV complete theory of quantum gravity. So it was an example where we could compare the predictions from theories we know from this general bootstrap approach just based on basic principles. So I will not give you the details, I will just tell you the results. So, as string theorists, we like to work in, uh, in uh, 10 dimensions. So let me consider a toy model in 10 space-time dimensions. Okay, and there's also like maximal supersymmetry, but it's not very important. And in that case, there is one coefficient alpha. So this is the leading, leading Wilson coefficient, it's like C1 if you want, in, in that formula. It's a bit different because it's a very special theory. But uh, I just wanted to tell you that in this case, we have a UV complete theory, which is string theory. And in string theory, there's almost no parameters, but there is one parameter, if you want, which is the string coupling that you can vary. And when you vary that parameter, alpha can vary. And alpha can take any value as long as it's bigger than something like 0 0.1389, okay? There's some special function you can compute. Okay? So this is what you get, not from principles, from examples. You look at the theory you know, that is UV complete, and you measure alpha, and you see all this range is possible, okay? From this number to infinity. And then if you do this approach that we, we implemented, so from this bootstrap, you get something close, okay? So now the best numerics we have give 0 0.124 plus or minus 0 0.03, okay? So, um, okay, I just wanted to show this because I think it's a very concrete example where you can compare predictions from low energies and basic principles with a situation where we know the UV complete theory in this 10 dimensional and, uh, and with supersymmetry, okay. maximal supersymmetry, okay. it's not, not important at this level. And you get very close answers, okay? In particular, you get consistency that our general principles do not exclude string theory, okay? That's good. And, uh, and there's a small range which is still in between, and okay, now we can debate if we are missing some constraints and this will close or not, okay? Okay, any questions about this? No, we believe that the bound is not converging to that. And uh, I mean, one natural explanation is that here we're only imposing elastic scattering, and here there is a lot of inelastic scattering, right? You form black holes. And all. In, a, in string theory, in bootstrap, we do some, so this is, we impose these principles in some uh, uh, numerical algorithm that we think converges to the optimal solution. And when it converges, we do have the full amplitude, yes. Actually, so it means that some assumption about the KVM in, in the bootstrap approach all the way, right? Let's put it this way. There are many constraints. We just impose a subset. It's easy to explain. So we impose... Yeah, the high energy behavior that we impose is, um, I mean, the constraint is correct, but the fact that we saturate this constraint is not physical. In general, we expect to produce many particles at high energies, but our amplitude does not produce many particles. But, okay. Good. I think it's time to move to the second part, if there is no further question. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, yeah, I think I can do this. So from from your physics, I guess you know that whenever you want to understand the system, it's good to put it in a box, right? When you want to do thermodynamics, you get a discrete spectrum, you can put it finite temperature. So things in a box are always better behaved. But it's a challenge to put uh, uh, gravity in a box, right? Because we, we don't know of an actual physical box that could stop gravity from propagating. But there is a great invention, which is this geometry called anti-the-sitter space-time, which is a box for gravity. Okay. So let me spend some time explaining this. So there is a... Well, I'll actually write the metric, okay? If, if you don't understand that, it's not important. I'll draw a picture. Okay? So, let me draw this metric. So, it's a cylinder. This is the space-time. Okay, so... Time is moving up in this cylinder. And so for every fixed time, you have a surface um, parameterized by this radial coordinate R that goes from 0, or maybe I put it like that, R goes from 0 to pi over 2, and pi over 2 is the boundary of space-time. Okay? It doesn't go further. It's really a box. And... Uh, and so at the boundary, you have time, and at the boundary, there's a two-sphere, right? An S2. So that's, that's this factor here. It's a, a two-sphere, like a sphere around the person. Okay, so that's the geometry. Now what's the physics here? Okay, so for example, you can just live at the center, sit here at the center, and stay here forever. Okay, so that's a nice position to be at the center of the world. Okay, that's a, that's a good geodesic in this sense. So why do we say it's a box? Well, you could, for example, somewhere here, throw light, okay? Turn on some light. So light will move, I mean, forward in time and away from you, and it will reach the boundary and reflect back to you in finite time. Actually, the time is pi times L, which L is this uh, length scale in front of the metric, okay? So it's a box in that sense. Uh, what else should I say? Ah, okay, I should say that if you... Let me maybe make it in blue. Suppose, suppose you're here and you throw some ball or some rock away from you, okay? So the rock goes, no, it goes slower than light, right? So it goes slower. Uh, sorry, maybe, let me do it at the same time. So at the same time you send light, you send the ball, so it goes slower. The ball will come back to you basically at the same time as the light came back. And it will oscillate like that around you. And in fact, in this picture, it looks like you are the center of the world and the ball is oscillating, but this is just a coordinate choice. If you sit on the ball, you also feel that you are at the center of the universe and uh, it's me that is oscillating around the ball. Okay, so every, this space is actually homogeneous, all points are the same, and isotropic, all directions are the same. Okay, so it's maximally symmetric, so, okay, I mean, it's hard to imagine a box like that, but it's, it's possible, this is the space. Any question about that? Good, no question. So, why is this box good for quantum gravity? Well, let's put gravity in this box. The first thing that, ha that we should do is, so this is just the fixed metric, like Minkowski, but gravity is dynamical metric, so we should let this metric vibrate. So let's let this metric vibrate and compute the uh, spectrum of the gravitational waves in this box. It's very nice, it's very simple. So the spectrum, so for if you want gravitational waves, have a spectrum which is just 1 over L. So L, you should think of it as the size of the box. Let's 
size. Okay. Remember that it was also the light, uh, the time it took for the particle for the light to come back to you. Times what? Times uh, three plus integers. N is zero, one, two. One. That's it. The spectrum is that that. It's just integers in units of uh, the size of the box. Okay. So like, that's nice. <laughs> it's a nice symmetric box. But now, what else do we know? Now let's quantize this system. So what do we quantize? For each mode of gravitational waves, we can put some occupation number, right? We can put gravitons are just occupation number of gravitational waves. Yes? So what, what is the spectrum, the spectrum of which waves? The second gender gravity wave is any frequency? Not any, f no, not any frequency. So inside a box, the frequencies are quantized. That's, that's the point. No, that's, that's not just gravity waves uh, around this geometry. Then you're really changing the geometry drastically by putting black holes. Okay. Right? So that's a very excited state at much more energy. Okay. So if you just put a little bit of smaller gravitational waves, it's quantized like that. We'll get to black holes, hope, hope, hopefully. Okay. So, so this is the energy spectrum of gravitons, of a single graviton, let's say, okay? So this is, the classical computation is the same as single gravitons. So what about multigravitons, right? If you put two gravitons, they will start to interact. So the energy, so let's say we put two gravitons. So the energy of two gravitons, well, we sum the energies, um, well, let me write it, 6 plus n1 plus n2, okay, explicitly, plus a small correction, sorry, plus a correction from interactions. Let's estimate what is the correction. I erased it, no, it's still there. The interaction should be uh, controlled by G Newton, right, that's interaction strength, times the energy square, so actually, it's better to write it like that. So G Newton is this uh, Planck mass um, square, uh, one over Planck mass square, and uh, and the energy here is all energies of order one over L. So you just get L squared. So this is the order of the correction. Okay. So now you should choose. If you want to describe something close to the real world, better be that you go to a box where this number is very, very large, so that you have a box much larger than the, the Planck length, okay? Another way of writing this is the Planck length over the size of the box, okay? So if you have a very large box in Planck units, the gravitons almost don't interact, okay? So that's the regime we want, is this number to be much larger than one. Okay, uh, what else do we want? Well, we want not to have... Yeah, okay, let me continue. So now let's ask the question of the title. So I told you there is a nice quantum system. There is a discrete spectrum. I know the spectrum. It's these integers. And there might be some small corrections when I have two graviton states. Can I find a full-fledged quantum mechanical system, okay, that it really obeys all the axioms of quantum mechanics, that has this energy spectrum at low energies? These are the first states. And then at high energies, I'm not very interested because I don't know what should be the UV completion, but I want it to be consistent with quantum mechanics all the way. Okay, do you know a system like that? So that's the great discovery of the end of last century, <laughs> is that uh, if you take a conformal field theory, okay, so this, uh, CST, <laughs> so, 
So, take a conformal field theory in three dimensions, two plus one, okay? So I will draw, it's a similar picture, but now it's just the boundary of that picture, okay? So put the theory, now there is no interior, it's just time and an S2, a sphere, okay? So maybe a better, a better picture like that, if you take t equals constant, in the lab, you will just have some sphere covered in some material, I don't know, graphene or something, and you're just studying the dynamics on the surface of this sphere, okay? So you are here, the experimentalist, playing with this sphere, okay? You can excite it, eh? and you want to study dynamics on this sphere. The fact that it's conformal, okay, it's, if you want to first think, it's scale invariant, so you could think of it as just having particles without mass in this sphere, okay, to first approximation, things like that. So it turns out that in any conformal field theory, if you put it on a sphere, um, these states, okay, the states with energy, so let's say you put here radius, the radius of the sphere, radius L, the states with energy 1 over L 3 plus N are automatic. Okay, are always there in any theory. Okay, okay. They, are, they are associated with the stress-energy tensor if you want, but it's just a general property of uh, uh, field theory in, uh, in this geometry. Okay, so that's good, right? We wanted to find, so this system is just, uh, sorry, I, I should emphasize that, this system is uh, there's no gravity here, okay? So this system, quantum mechanics, is just perfect. We know there's no violation, no problem uh, with uh, quantum mechanics. So, um, so it's a good candidate, and it has this part of the spectrum for free. Now, what about this part of the spectrum when you have many gravitons, okay? This does not come for free, okay? So this... Uh, so, so if you want to have the right uh, uh, energies, let's say, of two gravitons to be E1 plus E2 plus a small correction, like there, you need the existence of a small parameter, okay? So, uh, how should I write this? Okay, let's say 1 over L order 1 over MP. L square. So this implies that it exists a small parameter, let's call it C, sorry, a large parameter, okay, we usually use the large version. Let's call it C, which is much bigger than one, okay? So this is a non-trivial restriction on conformal field theory. It cannot be any, it has to have this property. Otherwise, it will not match the expectation from multigraviton states, okay? So, uh, yeah. And then there is another property which is very important, is that here, well, if you just put gravity, these are the only states. If you put the standard model, you will have, I don't know, also photons or electrons, but just a few states associated with each particle, right? So you need, you need also here that there are no other states, okay? Let me, let me go to the extreme case, no other uh, light states. Okay? Could be few if you put the standard model if you want, but no other light states. So that again is not general, not generic in the space of conformal field theories. So it imposes that you need to have some gap, so the, an energy gap for the other states, which also must be much larger than, uh, well, this 1 over L is the energy scale that we have here. Okay? So, so this is what we call uh, dual of quantum gravity in a box is a conformal field theory with these two properties, okay? Because it's quantum mechanically, quantum mechanical, and it reduces to the dynamics of gravity at low energies. Okay? So this is what we call holographic CFTs. Holographic CFT. Okay, so it's uh, with these two properties. 
uh, holographic, well, I hope it's clear why it's holographic, right? So here, the dynamics is only happening on the boundary, and you're describing, so the fundamental degrees of freedom that really uh, are described by this quantum system only live on the surface of these two sphere, and gravity is an alternative description, or, well, now it depends who you ask if it's approximate or equivalent description inside the, the geometry. Okay. okay, questions about this? Sorry, I, I didn't understand. What, what, what more degrees of freedom do I have here? In a sense, there's a bulk. I mean, also there. I mean, there's no bulk on that side, right? Right, I see. So apparently, since you have here one more dimension, it looks like you have more yeah. degrees of freedom. Yes. Maybe you can ask at the end. So I think your question makes sense if you go to high energies. Mm -hmm. Then uh, to have three dimensions or four dimensions will change the density of states of very high energies. So we'll come back to that at the end, okay? For a? <laughs> we don't know. That's a... Uh, so, right, so uh, flat space I started in the beginning, okay, we can do scattering amplitudes and we can do some progress there. If you put gravity in a box, we do much more progress, I will tell you more things, but we understand the situation more. If you put gravity in an expanding universe, we understand much less. So this is a big open question some people are thinking about, including myself, but... Uh, I don't think we are ready to share with you our uh, doubts and confusions. Um, ah, one thing that I should emphasize here is that this condition uh, implies that the degrees of freedom of the conformal field theory must be very strongly coupled. Okay, so if you, if you think, for example, I'll take the simplest example, Let's just put some massless particles, some massless scalar boson, or even a photon, some photon inside this uh, two sphere. The first states that correspond to that graviton are like two photon states. Okay? So the, the three photon states and the four fo and the five photon states, let's say, they can they're not compatible with being there. So they have somehow all of these states have to be lifted to very high energies due to interactions. Okay, so so this condition really forces you to have strong coupling. It cannot be some easy field theory that you can compute with Feynman diagrams. Okay, that's the main, one of the main obstacles to understanding explicitly this map. Okay, but now I think the most important question, now, so you see, now we translated a problem of quantum gravity to a problem of finding conformal field theories with two properties. Okay, so this is progress because we understand conformal field theories much better. But still, now the question is, do they exist? Do these theories exist? Are there conformal field theories with these properties? That's, I guess, the first natural question. And uh, exactly with these properties, we don't know. We don't know any example okay, that only has these states. All the examples we know have many more states than this at, at low energy. But we know some uh, close cousins, okay? So string theory, that's where string theory plays a big role. So, so far I didn't speak about string theory in this uh, quantum gravity in a box. But in practice, string theory is the only way we know to produce examples. And the examples are very similar to what I have there, but not quite the same. So let me just mention one or two things about the examples. So the, the string theory examples we know uh, 
uh, for example, related, the closest related to what I'm showing you, so this is four-dimensional space-time, so we call that AVS4. You don't get just the gravitons living in AVS4, but you get the gravitons living in AVS4 cross a seven sphere. Okay, so you actually, the, the examples we know don't give gravity in four dimensions, they give gravity in 11 dimensions. And there is no separation, okay? So this guy also has radius, radius L. So there's no separation between the states, the gravity waves inside this box and the gravity waves on the S7. Okay? So it's a big open question in the field if this is just an accident of the examples we know or if this is something fundamental. If we can actually find examples that don't have big internal spaces, if we can remove all the modes associated with this big sphere, or if, uh, or not, yeah. So I think if you do here a raise of hands, it's going to be, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. We should, it should be good to, to test that. Who believes there are scale separated uh, holographic CFTs? Okay, so, so there is a very small minority that includes me, so I'm definitely not representative in this, uh, in this topic. Okay, so that's an open question that divides the community. There's a similar thing about uh, supersymmetry, okay? So here, so I, I'm not going to explain what supersymmetry is, but so it's some special symmetry that relates bosons and fermions that we do not observe in the real world, but all these models have. And again, we don't know if it's fundamental or not. I, I will not ask raise of hands now. <laughs> I don't want to offend other people. Okay. Um, time flies. Okay. So let me give you an example. I think it's the most beautiful example. I'll spend all my time on that probably. Of a bootstrap logic applied to this context. Okay. Um, Yes, so how does this work? Let me, let me do it here. So the question is the following. We had there, we needed a gap, an energy gap to the next states. So we could ask the question, um, how large can E gap be? Okay. Can you make it uh, uh, what's the maximal value, okay? You probably expect that it goes to the Planck scale, right? At the Planck scale, we expect some new particles or something. Right? It would be even hard to conceive something without anything at the Planck scale, but below that, we don't know, okay? So can we actually take this picture seriously in terms of conformal field theory and prove a bound without just being waving our hands, but prove a specific bound on this maximal uh, energy to the next state, which is not a graviton. And so this was first done by one of our participants, uh, Simeon Hellerman, I don't know if he's here, in three dimensions, okay? So again, we don't know how to do it for four-dimensional gravity, but we know how to do it for three-dimensional gravity. So for three-dimensional gravity, let me just sketch for you how it goes, because it's kind of sufficiently simple to understand the, the main idea. For 3D gravity, we can, which means uh, two-dimensional conformal field theory, we can prove that this E gap, well, in units of this L all the time, sorry, actually it's better to do it like that, must be bigger. I think if you translate the current bound, it's like the Planck mass over six or something. There's some number here. Several people work hard to improve this number, but I think this is close to the best we have. Okay? So it confirms our expectation, but now it's really a number predicted from first principles, I was, as I will try to convince you now. Yes. Good. Someone is awake. Very good. Thank you. Very much. So yeah, you need some state below that. Okay? You cannot push it higher than that. So what's the logic? The logic is you just take this theory. So this is now one plus one dimensional, right? Time and just space is just a line. So put it on a circle. 
put it on a circle uh, of radius L. Okay, so the yeah of radius L. And compute at finite temperature. So compute the partition function. Z. Uh, so let me actually write Z of beta, which is just the inverse temperature, and uh, the length of the circle, which is 2 pi L. Right? So this is just the sum over all states, E to the minus beta, the energies of the states. Right? That's the thermal partition function of this theory. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, let me let me just leave it like that. Okay. Well, let me I, I need to be honest here. Okay, so let there is this factor here. So this is the Casimir energy. I need to practice my dishonesty on these talks, but okay. <laughs> so so when you put the theory on a circle, the vacuum doesn't have zero energy. There's a negative Casimir energy that shifts all the states by this constant. Okay? This C is basically the C as that large parameter defined there, and it's, uh, it's also called the central charge of this CFT. Okay? Good. So that's, that's something you can do. And now you can separate, right? You can separate this sum into uh, the states which are uh, I don't know, psi gravitons, right? E to the minus beta, E psi minus C over 12, 12L, plus the others, plus the states which have E psi bigger than E gap. Okay? E to the minus beta. Let me not write it again. Okay, we separate. So this we know because we know the spectrum of all graviton states. So in actual, that's one of the advantages of working here is that we even know the corrections that we interact with. Well, there is no corrections. Okay, so it's, we know. And this we don't know, but we know it starts only after the gap. And now we use some very basic property, which maybe some of you have heard about, is that when we compute a quantum system at finite temperature, is the same as adding one direction, periodic direction with period beta. So this function is basically the partition function, if you want to, in terms of path integrals, is a path integral on a torus, which has, so th this length of the torus is 2 pi L, 2 pi L, and then you make the torus, something like that, and this length is beta, okay? And the torus, this function is only a function of the geometry of the torus. So it doesn't care if you interchange 2 pi L with beta, because the torus is the same. You just look at it like this or like that. So you impose that this sum must be equal to Z of uh, uh, 2 pi L comma beta. Okay? You just permute, permute the, the argument. And then you impose one more thing, is since this is scale invariant, this theory doesn't have any other dimension, can only be a function of the ratio. Okay, so maybe I call small z of the ratio. Okay, 2 pi L over beta. So now you have a function, okay, this is a function, the same function of beta over 2 pi L. And now you just use this property. The fact that this function has to obey this uh, invariance and they're inverting the argument and it has this expansion immediately implies this property so there's some math that you can refine so Simeon did a very nice elegant simple proof and then Leonardo and friends and many people in our uh, community worked on improving this the best possible gap from this logic and you get that for free okay so this is I think a beautiful example of getting some physical bound on quantum gravity just from basic principles of uh, invariance and uh, if you want, looking at the geometry one way or the other, okay, of Euclidean geometry. Questions? I guess I'm already over my time. I still had a part about uh, black holes, but okay. Maybe I say in words or, or can I do, how many minutes do I have? But I, I actually need like, Five minutes is enough, I think. It's basically just a picture. 
Well, I don't know. If you are there, you decide. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so black holes, you learn something about black holes thinking about very excited states. Okay? So let's take this picture and think about uh, high energy states in this box. So, so from the box point of view, it's actually very easy. You can just do dimensional analysis. So if you, if, you, if you go to a very excited state, the only, I mean, the most relevant question is what is the, um, you will have many, many states, they will be dense. So you want to know the density of states, if you want, or the, the entropy, okay? So let's ask about that. So let's define the entropy density. So, so this is the entropy density, the, the, dense, the entropy per unit area. So this should be a function, uh, this should be some function of the energy, but should not be a function of total energy. If you go to very high energy, it should again be a function of the energy density, right? Because these are intensive quantities. Again, this is energy density, okay? But now, you see, you can just do dimensional analysis. So this is like one over length square, but here is one over length cube, okay? In my units, energy is one over length yeah, because of age. Mm -hmm. So the only thing this can be is epsilon to the two thirds, up to a number, okay? So here it's very simple. So this is CFT, CFT, three-dimensional CFT. What about the black hole? Okay, I will not do the calculation, but I will just tell you. So here you have this picture of ADS. And uh, if you want the most energetic states, you start putting a lot of matter. At some point, it collapses into a black hole. And so the states which have more energy uh, are a big black hole at the center of ADS. Okay? So uh, you can plot it like that. So there's some black hole, some, some horizon area. Okay? So you can compute the entropy using Hawking's formula, the area uh, of the horizon. Divided by this 4G Newton, right? This famous formula for the entropy of, uh, of a black hole. And you get on the nose the same scaling. Okay, I mean, okay. Actually, let me just, you get the same scaling, e to the two thirds. So for a given mass or energy of the black hole, you get that entropy. And um, now let me make a comment about the constant, okay? So what about the constant? Does the constant match? No, in general it doesn't. It matches automatically, again, for one lower dimension. If you do ADS3 CFT2, it's automatic. But if you do ADS4, so the actual four-dimensional gravity, this constant in general doesn't match, and it's an open question to show that in all series that obey these two properties, then the constant will match. Okay? We would expect that, that if it's really holographic, then this calculation should even match the constant. But this, we don't know how to do. Okay, so this, I hope this answers your question about the number of degrees of freedom. Because in gravity, it's not just thinking about modes in a high dimension, really the most excited state is a black hole, and then in black hole you change the counting because it starts to be proportional to the area. Okay, so let me finish. Clearly I'm already over time. So here now the main open question, so this is like physics from last century. The, the main open question now is to try to understand in detail where does this entropy come from, right? This entropy in a quantum mechanical system comes from a very, very dense spectrum of microstates. And so we can ask the question, can we count these microstates precisely as integers in quantum gravity? Okay, some people are doing that in some special models with extreme precision holography. 
In the general case, we don't hope to count them, but we can perhaps understand some statistical properties of them, like level repulsion or how operators and disconnects with quantum chaos and eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and things like that that we're also discussing in the program here. So, but I guess that's another, another seminar. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so here, well, I didn't put it in that in those terms, but so this this geometry actually has negative cosmological constant. Okay, so this is the opposite of uh, right. This, instead of being an expanding universe, this box has negative cosmological constant. So you're trying to. It's a good question. I think we are very far from that, yeah. That, that connects with the previous question about if we understand quantum gravity in an expanding universe. I think we are far from understanding that, yes. One question. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry if this is a very uninformed un question. You can imagine building a quantum theory in a, in a classical field space time. I guess it's a, you know how to do it. Uh, yes, that's a good question. I think there is. So, so you're saying, can is it consistent to couple quantum mechanical degrees of freedom to classical degrees of freedom? Yeah, I think this is. No, but if you. Sorry, if unitarity is broken, isn't that already pretty terrible? But you still have uh, probabilities sum to one, or uh, you also abandon that principle? I mean, it's it's ah, you, in the sense that you go to mixed states, okay, yeah. in that sense. Uh, yeah, that. Yes, that per se, I don't think it would be inconsistent because you. It's equivalent to saying that. We, we are uh, interacting with some other quantum mechanics of freedom, quantum mechanics of freedom, that then we lose touch, right? That part of the wave function is removed from us, so effectively we become a mixed state, right? Because we trace over those. So that, in principle, would not be uh, inconsistent, but... Um, Yeah, let me think. How is it? I think I thought about something like that. So you, you can do like a stern Gerlach experiment, right? You split, and so you have like a superposition of particles one way or the other, and then depending if it's on this way, you like move some planet one way and some planet the other way, so then you will have two branches of the wave function where the classical configuration of the geometry is like completely different. Uh, so I, I think by doing experiments like that, you will you will run into big but trouble. Uh, 
No, they're not gravity constant in this case, right? Because the gravity is always plus. Well, there was an attempt by Hawking at some point to propose that uh, physics is governed by uh, a dollar matrix instead of a matrix, violating you know, the, 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 the unitarity. It's pretty hard to to rule that out with black holes at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, people argue, various people, that uh, if you take this seriously, that's bound to show up in microscopic physics as well, virtual processes, and that it actually gets worse and worse as you go to high energy, uh, which is understandable, and that you know it, it would be hard to I mean, you know, we have many, many experimental consequences of quantum mechanics that are verified to extraordinary accuracy. We do everything we do in physics. It's really hard once you introduce a, uh, this kind of nonlinear, uh, nonunitary evolution, it's bound to permeate all of physics. Uh, but, you know, Objected to the Hawking uh, attempt to uh, violate unitarity, uh, came up with uh, reasonable explanations of where he went wrong in his argument that unitarity was violated. So most people don't have that, you know, give it more that way. Of course, gravitons directly haven't. Let, let me try to answer to answer again. I think it goes in the side. So you're proposing this, right? That this is quantum. You just take quantum average, and this is classical. But but I think this. Yeah. So so let's so let's do this experiment that I was saying. Okay. Suppose you you split some quantum process, and then uh, based on the on what happens on that uh, process, you put like some planet there, or some mountain there, or some mountain there. Okay. So you make a different. So inside T mu nu. So this is quantum. There's a quantum superposition between mountain here or mountain in Santa Barbara. Okay? But this is the average. So the gravitational field is going to see half the mountain here, half the mountain in Santa Barbara. So now as you move, you think you are in the branch where the mountain is here in Colita. But then when you pass by Santa Barbara, you feel a gravitational field of half a mountain that is not there. Yeah, I think this is the problem with this theory. Right? Because you're sensitive to the average. It was better, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Yes. Yeah. No, but it's uh, Seems like a good place to stop. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you.